Hello everyone, my name is Darlene Arnett, and today my presentation is going to cover everything there is to know about getting ready to put fall bulbs in your garden. We'll cover a lot of things today, and so let's get started. So here's the to-do list for today and we will cover all of these topics. I'd like to draw to your attention to a couple of things on the slide. One is the photos of all the bulb catalogs. And today you're gonna to hear me talk a lot about ordering bulbs through catalogs because I have found that the quality of the bulbs and the selection is much greater than what you can find locally. That's not to say you can't find bulbs locally, but I just find that there's so much more to offer if you can find a catalog that appeals to you and also allows you to perhaps select something you would not have available any other way. The other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the last thing on the list, which is planting for bees. I'm going to cover this toward the end of the presentation and it's because I think it's really important to have diversity in the garden and there's a lot of talk about bees and pollinators today and for the most part they deal with annuals and perennials. So we're just going to take a look at adding bulbs to that list. So the important thing to know about having the bulbs for the bees is that this is their first chance to have some very rich, protein rich nectar and pollen, especially the early bloomers. These bulbs are going to provide some of the first food they've had after a very long winter. And remember that bees and other pollinators are essential to the world's food supply. What is a bulb? Well, it's actually a whole entire storage system. It includes all the things that are needed to have that plant rise up through the ground, break ground, and create a flower. Included in that category are gonna be corms, tubers, and rhizomes. What I've covered here are just some basic bulbs you hear about all the time. Tulips, daffodils, and lilies are bulbs. Crocuses, colchicums, and gladiolas are corms. You also have, in the tubers category, begonias and cyclamens. And lastly, and probably familiar to you, would be irises, but also trilliums are rhizomes. So these are all bulbs. Let's talk about the life cycle of bulbs. Most bulbs are only going to last three to six years. They can actually be much shorter on the specialty bulbs. They may only last one or two years. But when you're looking in the catalog, you'll see them referring to parentalizing bulbs or naturalizing bulbs. Those terms mean something a little different but generally mean that you should have the bulbs lasting that three to six year span that you would expect. Naturalizing is just creating an area that looks, of course, natural, but also the bulb you've put in that natural area is going to divide and what we call colonize an area. This can be under your turf or in just another area of your garden. Here's a picture of what it means to naturalize in your turf grass. So simply, you're just going to cut back the turf, and it won't hurt the turf to do this, and put your bulbs underneath the sod. The best way to know what the depth is gonna be is to go back and check the label or the package or the catalog where you bought those bulbs and make sure you do get them in the proper depth. It's kind of nice to have something like this pop up through your lawn in early spring. 
There's just another picture of crocus that I've naturalized in a lawn. Just know that this takes several years. And of course, the more bulbs you put in initially, the faster this kind of naturalizing will occur. Here's another great picture of daffodils in a wooded area. Again, this technique takes some time. And it can be done on a smaller scale than this. So don't get discouraged by the large amount of space you see in this photo. You could take a corner of your yard or a natural area next to your lawn and do the same thing. Location. Photos taken in spring would be the best way to find the spaces that the bulbs would fit in. You're going to need to mark them because believe me, you won't remember where they are by using utility flags, paint sticks, scraps of wood, anything you can come up with that'll give you an idea of where that location is at. You can find spots in the fall. The problem with that is that if you're gonna let the garden remain standing during the winter, then it becomes a little tougher to find those spaces. However, it can be done, and again, you would just use some markers to do that. A diagram or a sketch to go back to is also helpful. And remember that most bulbs are going to have to have four hours of sunlight. The good thing about that is that then you know that you could plant them under trees and shrubs. Because early, you won't have any leaves on the trees or the shrubs. Also remember that southern exposure will have your bulbs blooming earlier than a northern exposure. Be careful of low spots in your gardens or your lawn for a couple of reasons. One is it catches water and water can be an enemy to bulbs. They could rot in the ground. Uh, and just know that also cold air settles there first. Soil preparation is important as it is for annuals and perennials. It's the same kind of situation with bulbs. Most bulbs like a pH balance of six to seven. There are soil test kits at the garden center, or you can take a sample to the local extension office, and for $15, they'll test it for you. You're going to need to amend the soil. You're going to need to loosen the soil in the area where you're planting. If you can remove the clay, you'll be better off. If you don't have a way of doing that, then the next step is to consider, of course, amending that soil. Using your homemade compost, if you have it, is the best thing. You can also add leaf litter, but know that bulbs cannot thrive in hard clay soil. The amendments need to be worked to the depth of 12 inches if that's the final depth of the bulb you're planting. It could be less than that depending on what the depth is for that particular bulb. Fertilizer. And I'll mention this several times in this presentation and that people seem to forget that bulbs do need fertilizer. And the best is to buy organic fertilizer. 5105 would be on the label. You'll put some in initially when you plant the bulbs, but you also need to repeat it in the spring as soon as the shoots come up. Again, you can also use compost on top of the soil. A couple of inches will be enough. What you don't want to do is after the flowers have already begun to bloom, you don't want to fertilize them. They really don't need it at that point. Again, they need it just as they're breaking out of the ground. This depth chart, I think, is a great one. It's kind of a cross-cut view of some very good looking soil. Of course, we all know in Missouri, you may not have soil that looks this good, but it is the kind of soil you'll need to have the bulbs thrive. As you can see, there's some varying depths. Right up close to the top is begonia, and down deep is a tree lily. This is a chart that I really like because it has so much information in it. You can see that it gives you the varieties for early, mid, and late spring, and then it also tells you the depth at which they probably need to be planted. 
I got this chart out of the Burpee American Gardening Series book called Bulbs. It's a great book. It's one you could probably find at a garage sale or in your local library. But I do think that a chart like this is helpful to also decide what are the varying heights of the bulbs and how can I get something to be flowering from early spring to late spring. Let's talk about planting. And fall is the time, that's what we're talking about, but know that you have really until the ground freezes to get them into the ground. So that could be mid-December or late December. But for the sake of having the bulbs be really ready to get that cold storage they need during the winter, I would get them in the ground as soon as you can. Another reason is because if they're laying around, they have a tendency to maybe dry out or try to sprout. And it's hard to find a cool, dry place to store them, especially if we're having a lot of hot weather. It's okay to plant bulbs close together, or you can space them out. Spacing them out will give them time to multiply. If you want to plant a whole lot of bulbs, like 50 at a time, of the same thing, then just dig one big large hole. Again, you'll want to mark that location because you're going to want to know what's going to come up in the spring. And trust me, you will not remember that exactly. So your markers are important. Here's an example of digging out a big hole and putting in many, many bulbs. This gives you a great big burst of color. Very noticeable in your yard. Um, it's just lovely to have that kind of effect. One of the things you'll need to do is try to determine how many bulbs you'll need. There are some guidelines about that in the catalogs. There's also guidance in uh, some of the books you can get out of the library and of course online. But you're probably gonna always need more than you think you do. At least that's been my experience. Most tools in this slide are available at garden centers. The lower right photo is called a bulb dibble, D-I-B-B-L-E. And usually, although not shown in this picture, it will have two inches, three inches, four inches, in other words, uh, a depth marked on the bottom half of it. So you then, when you're planting bulbs, you can see how far down you're going. Obviously, these tools are made to dig one hole at a time. And as you can see, some of them are going to be useful if you're trying to dig one hole out in your yard or in a spot where you're putting bulbs around something or you just don't feel like you want to dig up the turf. Again, most of these would be available at a local garden center or nursery. The one on the left, using the drill with an auger is a real efficient way to do it. The auger can be a real fast way to get a lot of bulbs in very quickly. Watering. Water the bulbs after you plant them and then weekly, especially if we're not getting any rain. If you're going through a period of time when we have lower than normal rainfall, then for sure weekly watering is going to be necessary. Remember to water deeply as many of the bulbs can be eight inches or more. Another technique is to mulch them to keep them moist and retain the water you've put on them. My caution to you is not to overwater them because again, you'll have a rotting problem with the bulbs. And lastly is the foliage, which I'll mention several times, but the foliage needs to die down and remain around the plant until such times it turns brown. This ensures that the plant will have enough energy to rebloom next year. Maintenance and care. Let's talk about fertilizing them again because in my research I found that 
bone meal is not an especially good fertilizer, although you will see it advertised for bulbs. I would again use a granular fertilizer of 5105. And again, I'll mention the compost, an inch or two a year. And lastly, again, do not remove the leaves until they turn yellow. Eventually they'll decompose right back into your garden. Ordering. Fall is the time of year to order your bulbs or buy them locally. If you want daffodils, tulips, and hyacinths in unusual or different colors, you're going to have to think about going ahead and buying them as early as possible. This would be late August and September. Ordering online from the catalogs is a good idea. And I would do it early because they will sell out of their stock and you might not be able to order the ones you really want. My recommendation is to do that no later than October as November might be too late. Again, that would be because they're out of stock on certain bulbs. A lot of people wonder why their bulbs quit flowering. And there's a lot of reasons for that. They maybe don't have enough water. So again, the watering is important. If the foliage has been cut off before it turned brown, that'll cause it to cease flowering. You also want to also make sure you're doing the fertilization. And an uncommon one that people forget about is insufficient light. The bulbs need photosynthesis to form food, fats, and proteins. So you'll need to check and see if your location for the bulbs has been compromised by growth of trees and shrubs. Think about trimming back your trees and shrubs so the light can get in there and force the bloom. Another common problem can be that bulbs purchased from a big box store have been exposed to temperatures of 70 degrees or higher. This does diminish the bloom. I would highly recommend getting bulbs from big box stores into the ground as quickly as possible. Again, most of the time the reputable mail order catalogs will be mailing the bulbs to you when they think the fall weather is optimal for your region. And of course your local nursery will have them in stock during the fall months. Another reason for the bulbs not to flower would be because they're getting eaten by mice or other animals. The most common animal that likes bulbs is voles. I haven't been able to find a lot of research on what to do about that. I think for the most part, um, because voles come from underground, the deeper the bulb, the more likely is that it might be left alone by the bulls. There was one article I read that said if you, if you have bulbs that are gonna be five inches or more, that the bulls won't bother them because their tunnels are usually about only four inches down. The other thing is trying to use some sort of chicken wire, but actually a different location is probably the best answer. You may not know that bees will nectar on many kinds of bulbs. Consider adding a few to help out the early bees that need the protein and which can't be provided by annuals or perennials because they are not ready to bloom. The bees and pollinators that need food early are really hungry because they've had nothing all winter long. By planting the right bulbs, home gardeners can attract pollinators to their gardens in early spring. Planting a large area of bulbs creates a smaller area for them to travel to get to the pollen. So large swaths of bulbs like crocus are really nice for them. It's an easy way for them to get to some nectar. These swaths create a very naturalistic setting and also it's a playground for the bees. Here is a list of common bulbs that I found in the John Shepherd's Fall 2018 catalog. 
as I was looking through their catalog, I came across this information about common bulbs that would be effective in offering bees a variety of food. I have used the common name instead of the botanical name, as most of those might be familiar to you. However, you may not find some of these at the nursery or garden centers. You'll probably have to get online and see if you can find them from bulb suppliers. So take it a step further, and wouldn't it be nice to have some native bulbs for bees? There are a few that will fit the bill. These are perennials that will return every year, and most of them spread and or colonize. They are available through most of your local native plant nurseries. The plant nursery that I like the most for natives is the Missouri Wildflowers Nursery near Jeff City, Missouri. That's not to say that you couldn't contact other native nurseries to see if they have these bulbs. I especially like the first one called Spring Beauties as it forms loose colonies of plants and usually has lots of bees on it. I have these in my garden and I just find that they always have small bees on them. So you really have to get down on the ground to see them, but they're there. There's also a perennial with blue trumpet shaped buds called Virginia bluebells. It will be very happy in a moist shady area. The trout lily will have yellow bell shaped perennial flowers. And again, it will spread. Also, the trout lily has its own pollinator, the trout lily bee. Now I'd like to add to the mix some native ground covers. These again will be something that could be growing between your bulbs. Remember that when the bulbs die back and you do have the brown foliage, you probably prefer to have something that covers that up or at least might hide it for a short period of time until you can remove the brown. The first one I'd like to talk about is pussy toes. This plant has silvery foliage. It's very close to the ground. It tolerates dry areas and medium sun. The name refers to the flower that resembles a cat's paw. Common blue violet. Although most of you probably think this is a weed, it actually can become a very important nectar plant for bees. So instead of pulling it, let it grow and cover some bare ground and feed the bees. Also, it's the host for several species of fritillary butterflies. We also have a wild strawberry. And these berries are edible. They're not very big, but they are edible. This will work as a dense mulch in a garden bed that's in a sunny area. And the last one is a favorite one of mine known as squaw weed. It has very early yellow blooms that draws lots of small bees. It's also evergreen in that it stays green all winter and it will do well in sun or shade. It is a tough, tough plant. In doing my research for determining what kinds of bees would be nectaring early, I realized there was a commonality in these five types of bees. They seem to be very busy early in the garden. You can see that collectively, there could be 756 species of bees that could visit your garden if you planted bulbs and ground covers that would attract them. That I think should be your motivation to get a few of these into the garden. The other thing you can do with bulbs is you can put them into containers. One way to add some color is to force bulbs to bloom in a container. This would be an outdoor container. This is a fun project and it's not difficult. It's even one that the kids might help you do. There are many resources for finding out how to do this. The one that I like is a article on planting bulbs and containers on the National Gardening Association's website. It's like 
a page and a half and very easy to follow. And this photo is just some other types of plants that do well indoors. They do not necessarily need to be forced. Forced means you have taken bulbs that you would normally put in the ground and instead have put them outdoors in containers. Remember that all bulbs need a cold spell. They need the cold weather and they need that cold time to store all of their energy up so they can bloom in the spring. Paper whites and hyacinths are the most common things you'll see in the garden centers that will be ready to come inside right away and be sitting on your window seal. The photo on the right are the paper whites, the left are the hyacinths. The last two slides are the references. The references will provide you with some additional material. Comments on this presentation can be made on the Resilient Activist website under EnviroTips. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video.